Well, today we continue in a series called The Way, and, and what we have done, we've, we've unpacked, or beginning to unpack, and we'll continue to unpack these seven I Am statements of Jesus on his way to the cross. And we know that he is the way, the truth, and the life, but on the way to the cross, he's unpacking these amazing truths of the kingdom of God. He's using different metaphors and, and, and using it in a literal sense as well to help us see who he is and what his heart is for his people. And so I pray that you're available for every one of these uh, messages as part of the series. If you're not, we want you to jump on YouTube and make sure you're keeping up to date with all of them as we're really unpacking what we believe is the heart for God's kingdom and for our homes. And so today, I want to talk to you for the next few moments, which I think will be something that will be very introspective. I want you to look at your neighbor and ask them this question. Does your light lead people to Jesus? You don't get to leave here thinking about somebody else. Today you're going to, ask to have to ask this question as you leave today and hopefully be able to answer this question. Does your light lead people to Jesus? I'm so excited to jump into this message today with you. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. With all of our hearts, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, Lord, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Lord, we pray lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from this evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So Holy Spirit, as we honor you and welcome you into this time, may it be pleasing, not to people, but to you and in your sight, we pray. In Jesus' name, someone say Amen. Just felt the Lord prayer on my spirit. I just went with it. Anybody just feel it every now and then? A good Lord's prayer just feels good just reciting the words of Jesus sometimes. Well, I want to start today by asking you a question. Do you know the most amazing phenomenon in the world? Do you know one of the most amazing phenomena in the world is actually the power of light? Someone say the power of light. Thank you. The power of light. Maybe if you paid attention in school, and some of us may have not paid attention in school, but there's so much importance that science reveals about the power of light that I want to set this up so you understand where we're going in our message today and why Jesus talks about the power of light. But the power of light has so many amazing qualities I'm going to show you. So I've got a couple of things I want to list here as I studied the power of light this week that I want to share with you. And maybe you're aware of them. But the first one is this. Light is made up of energy and travels in a straight line. So we're talking about something so powerful that's made of energy. While certain light is perceivable by the human eye, the majority of light remains invisible to our senses. There's all kind of light going around you and I today that we don't even see in the form of X-ray or infrared or microwaves or gamma rays or, yes, even radar. Watch this one. The speed of light, this is not a typo. I checked it three times. The speed of light is 186,000 miles, someone say, per second. That is amazing. Watch this one. Traveling at the speed of light, a person could go around the earth 7.5 times in all of one second. Are you seeing what I'm talking about, about the power and the strength of light? It's amazing. Now we go from earth to the sun. Watch this. The sun is just a, just a, a short 93 million miles away, and the sunlight takes only eight minutes to get to earth. It was Albert Einstein who said this. It's pretty amazing when you put it in context of what we're going to talk about today. If you could travel at the speed of light, time would cease to be. If we knew someone who was greater than anything, if we knew someone who was greater than light, he would cease to be held down by the constructs of light and time. Wouldn't that be amazing? Do you know there's nothing in our understanding quite like the power and the strength of light? Light's pretty important. I want to kind of open up the conversation for a moment and ask you another question. Do you remember the first time in your life where you recognized light to be an important thing? Can you go back? Is it the nightlight for you? Anybody a nightlight person? Anybody just, just doesn't like the dark? The dark's not fun for anybody. I don't know who likes the dark. Do you remember being a nightlight person? Or maybe if you grew up around here, around hurricane season, you loved you some flashlights and candles. Because when that power went out, there was no... There was no, you didn't know when it was coming back. There was no guarantee. And so maybe that was a time in your life where you really appreciated the power or the functionality of light. For me, I never knew how much I appreciated light until I went to a place called Maryland. Who's been to Maryland before? What are your thoughts of Maryland? I just want to put this out to the crowd. What are your thoughts? When you think of Maryland, what do you think about the place called Maryland? What do you think about? You know what I think about? 
I think about the Beltway and how you don't want to be on that thing. I think about the Baltimore Orioles. Any Orioles fans in here? I know I've got one here, yes? Okay, a few in the, any Washington Commanders fans? Still trying to get you seeing Commanders, right? Right, that's what I think about. I think about like the hustle, the bustle, I don't know, maybe the Baltimore Aquarium. Well, this one Thanksgiving, I was visiting my girlfriend, hope to be wife. Didn't even want to worry about fiance. Girlfriend, hope to be wife. Courtney Morgan, her family lived in Maryland. And so I'm surprising her and I'm going to drive there and show up to this place called Maryland. And what I found out is there are places of Maryland that are completely rural. Did you know this? No Baltimore Orioles. No Beltway. I showed up to this place. I think it was called Boyd's. And it was like rolling hills and it was farms. And it seemed like a great place to be until it got dark. You probably don't know about country dark, do you? See, I, I'm not from these parts of the world, and I'm not readily uh, familiar with when you put your hand in front of your face and you can't see it, that kind of dark. And then we would be around her family, all of her uncles, Uncle Dan, Uncle Sonny, talking about all the things they hunt, and they need these really big guns to kill them. I didn't like being in the dark there. And so I remember the appreciation of flashlights, and I preferred at night to stay indoors just in case a guy like me being my height, I'm the same height as the prey out there. And I don't want people to get confused on who's the animal, who's the human. And so I just remember like, hey, Court, let's go inside. Let's go for a walk just around the house, not so much outside at night. And so I can remember my appreciation of light. Um, but it's so interesting, the parallels that you and I are going to walk into today what God talks about light, how he uses the metaphors in the literal sense of light. And you'll see Jesus talking about it, but what's so interesting is that the power of light, the use of light from the scientific perspective, from the spiritual perspective, you might not have remembered this, but on the very first page of your Bible, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. If you have your Bible, turn to page one. If you have your Bible app, just go to that very first tab that says G-E-N for Genesis. In chapter one, what you're going to see is from the very outset, God wants you and I to be a student or at least astute in the power of light. Can I show you? You can probably quote this. It says this in Genesis 1. If you know it, say it with me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I heard this a long time ago that if you can get past Genesis 1-1, you can believe everything in the Bible. If you can believe God created the heavens and the earth and everything that we see, the rest is history, as they say. If he created it, then we can have faith in everything else. But it says, he created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void. And here's the key. There's darkness. So what does God do with darkness? It's void. It's without form and with darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God. Do you guys know who that is? The Holy Spirit, the Huach of God. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be what? Very beginning, three verses into your Bible. This is the infallible word of God. Three verses in, he says, you need to know about something called light because he's going to use it in very significant ways. He said, and let there be light. And guess what happened, guys? And there was light. Here's the big bang theory. God said it and bang, it happened. All right. There it is. We just proved the theory. Verse four. And God saw the light and that it was good. You know why God said the light was good? Because God doesn't like country dark either. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Don't act like you like the dark, all right? But what's so interesting is that darkness allows us to recognize the light. And as a matter of fact, you and I might not appreciate the light without the darkness. I'm pretty sure it's every generation, but specifically in our generation, what do we say? The world is getting so dark. Like, my goodness, it seems like there's more that are against us and more than are with us. And, and there's so much happening in our society and our culture. Like, can we really raise our, our kids in this generation? Can we really raise our grandchildren in this generation? Can we really have godly marriages in this generation? Can we really represent the Lord in, in the workplace and still, you know, climb and, and grow in our careers? Can we really be in that space? And I've got good news for you. No matter how dark the world has been, the bright light of Jesus has always been brighter. No matter what generation, no matter who was the world power, Rome, or Athens, or Egypt, or Babylon, you name it, no matter who it was, no matter how dark it was, his light to this very day has always been brighter. 
Elijah cried out to God, I'm the only one left still worshiping you, still serving you. And God's like, man, I've reserved some prophets in a cave just, just not too far from here. And so I want to encourage you with that because there are moments, there are seasons in society and culture and country and world where you're just like, God, what is happening and when are you coming back? But just rest assured, his bright light has always been that much brighter. What I hope to do at this point in our conversation today is help set up that there's a beautiful relationship between God and light. And not only God and light, but the earth that we live in in light. As a matter of fact, what God has done, he set up this temporary light in a temporary world called the sun and called the moon. You've probably never called the sun or the moon temporary, have you? Well, I want to help you see something here. This earth, this world, this life you and I are living, it is temporary. Someone say temporary. That means temporary. It doesn't last. The Bible is very clear that this earth is going to go one day. There's a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Put your hands together if you're excited about that one day, that this is not all there is to life. And if I do anything good with the platform that God has given us here, I will tell you he's coming back. He's coming soon and prepare your hearts. His return is not far. He is coming, the Bible says, like a thief in the night. This life is but a vapor. He is coming back. And because he's coming back, you know what he's done? He set up temporary shelter called earth and temporary light called the sun in the day and the moon in the night. Why do I call it temporary? Well, the scripture tells us this, that it's temporary. And I'm going to show you in a minute. But I also want to highlight this to you. The Bible begins, the first three verses, what did it talk about? The light that God creates, and guess how it ends, Revelation 21 and 22, the light that God is. Let me show you this. Revelation 21 says, the city had no need of the temporary sun and moon, right? It's not eternal, it's temporary, sun and moon, to shine in it. Why? For the glory of God illuminated it. Are you kidding me right now? And watch this, gets better. And the lamb, who is the lamb? Jesus, the lamb is its light. And the nations, we're part of this, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in his light. Just temporary, the sun and the moon. And then the actual last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, says this. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light. This is a temporary shelter of earth with temporary night lights and temporary flashlights called the sun and the moon. And you and I, no matter what this life looks like, we don't get caught up in this life. We prepare, the Bible says, for the next life. We prepare for what God is going to do, where the permanent light, we're told, the glory of God illuminates heaven. Does that encourage anybody today? Permanent light. So with this understanding of light and mind, Jesus references this subject matter in a conversation. Who was with us last week? You were with us last week? If you were with us last week, we talked about John chapter 6. And what did Jesus talk about? He said, I am, say it with me if you remember, the bread of life. And so this is where he starts, where he says he's the bread of life and that this bread of life reveals our motives because the people following him, they're a bunch of groupies. They're a bunch of religious, traditional people. They didn't want him. They wanted what he provided. They weren't there to seek his presence. They were there to get his stuff from him as presence. And so he clears that up really quick, and now he pivots from John chapter 6 now to John chapter 8. You can open your Bible to John chapter 8. That's where we'll be. You can put your apps there. John chapter 8 and verse 12. And here's the pivot for the subject matter. Here's where he's going to speak metaphorically and where he's going to speak in a literal sense. And he wants to combine these two. And now that you understand the power in the dynamic of light from Revelation 1, I'm sorry, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21 and 22, and all of our cool facts about light, now let Jesus take the conversation. John chapter 8 and verse 12 says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said this. I am, say it with me, the light of the world. It might not excite you as much as it excited people in this time. They didn't have electricity, didn't have the LEDs, so light meant a lot. It was, it was a high premium for them. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of what? life. This is not just any old kind of light. What is it? The light of life. This light of light we're told, light of life we're told, leads us out of darkness and into life that we will never 
have to walk in darkness again. This was different type of language than people were used to. This is messianic language. You know what messianic language is? This is someone who's the Messiah, the promised one, who steps through 42 generations. This is him. They had not heard this language before that he professes to be in John 6, the bread, and now in John 8, the light of life. What is he doing here? Why is he using this language? Well, let me, before you even get to light, do you know what he said before light? He says, I am. Might sound normal in our context, but not for this context. Jesus here in this scripture, he is using unusual grammatical constructs with the word I am or with the words I am. He hopes for his audience then to notice as well as his audience to come to notice that these words I am should be referenced and paralleled to other words. If you're a quick turner, you don't have to go there. It'll be on the screen. But Jesus is referencing words spoken by somebody else. I don't know if you recognize the I am statement here. But Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. In the same way last week with the bread, we had to go from John 6 to Exodus 16. Now we have to go from John 8 to Exodus 3. Watch what Exodus 3 is. This is God speaking to Moses out of a burning bush. And what does God say to Moses? God said to Moses, say it with me, I am who I am. This is who you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so when Jesus used this language, what is he doing? parallel language to God, saying that I am the light of the world. He's saying, I am God in the flesh. I have been sent by God. And similar to Moses, he's having to convince people that what? He's sent by God. Not on his own accord, but he is being sent by God. And it's so interesting because even in the translation of the Bible, I think we're all familiar in this room for the most part that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. And so as those who translated the Old Testament to the New Testament in Greek, the Greek New Testament, Greek Bible New Testament is called the Septuagint. So what they noticed is that there was the same language that Jesus used that God used. Same language in John 8 as in Exodus 3, because I am is speaking. And if you don't know the I am, the I am literally means his, his name, God revealed to be Yahweh. There's, there's more in that language, in that context, if we probably understand it to be. But when he said, I am, he is saying, I am equal to God. I am the one that you have been waiting for. So this right now opens up the conversation. This right now causes some to believe and some to disbelieve. This right now sets the line in the sand. All those who believe walk this way, and those who don't believe walk that way. This takes all the gray, because we love operating the gray in our society, don't we? We, we love looking and sounding and looking and playing both sides of mm -mm. this, Jesus sets the gauntlet down. I am the light of the world. He wants it to be very, very clear what light is and what darkness is. And in a world that loves to blend the lines and blur the lines and be so seeker friendly, sometimes we're missing the Holy Spirit. In a world that we want to do everything to grow everything except for our spiritual health. We want to grow every location and every building except for the home and the marriage. And that kind of society, we're bringing it back. We're bringing it back. He is drawing a line between light and darkness, wholeness and brokenness. And we will not blur those lines. Jesus comes to the world to display this literal light and darkness. And when you read and study the words, the actions and the life of Jesus, it's very clear. It's very clear. Jesus, it sounds like he only had a three-year ministry, only 36 months, but there was so much in there to show us that for him, there was no room for spiritual darkness, there was no room for gray areas, and there was no room for moral relativity. No room at all. Let me give you the definition just so we can be on the same. Relativity is this, the absence of standards of absolute and universal application. Here's what it means. You know, when your friends, your family, people you talk to, they're like, oh, I'm a good person and I'm going to heaven. I believe good things happen to good people. Someone tried that on Jesus one time. Do you remember that? They tried that good stuff happens to good people. They tried the karma stuff on Jesus. Well, I just believe if you mean good, you mean well, good and well things happen to you. They tried that on Jesus one time and Jesus just gave it to him right back. He says this in, in, in Mark 10, 18. Watch this. He says, I'm sorry, no one's good. Because your version of good doesn't equate to somebody else's version of good. 
in your relative version of good doesn't equate to somebody else's. And so he says, no one is good except God alone. And it's, 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 it's beautiful because Jesus sets the marker that there's no one good. We all live in darkness until we repent of our sins, welcome Jesus into our life, and live for God as his disciple. Then we become part of the light and not the darkness. Jesus and the gospel he preached, and I don't want to misconstrue it because it is by far the most inclusive gospel the world has ever known. Because when we say light and darkness, we're like, what is he, this big angry judge looking to say, hey, you go there and you go there and you don't belong? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the gospel is very clear that the Bible says we come as we are. Do you remember when you found Jesus? You came as you were. You didn't have to clean up everything about yourself. You didn't have to clean up your language, clean up your lifestyle. You didn't have to do anything. You came as you were. And what did he do? He loved you as you were. Can you imagine? If we came to God, we had to know his word. We had to clean up the way we acted, the way we thought, the way we treated others, our hang-ups, our bias, our leans, our private sin. Can you imagine? But he loves us too much to leave us that way. So we come as we are, but then in his grace, in his strength, he changes as we move forward. Even though there's light and there's darkness, he accepts us as we are. And we have to be careful with that as a church, right? We accept certain people from certain walks of life and, well, you know, what is your background? Or how are you dressed? Or, or what do you believe? No, you don't even have to believe to belong here. You come as you are and we depend on the truth of God's word to sanctify you. Anybody remember that word, sanctify? That's a good word. Sanctification and holiness. Anybody want to start dancing at those words? Good words. They're not evil. They're good words. We want to be sanctified in our mind and sanctified in our heart. We want to live holy. I got another word for you, righteous. Oh, man, that feels good. I feel like an old hymn. Anybody know an old hymn? Just come up here and just, just hit it. Just go with it. Like this sanctification and holiness and righteousness, that crazy thought. We want to look like the God we read about. I don't want to be mistaken for the world. I don't want to be mistaken for somebody far from God. I want people to see me and see a light in my life. I want people to see my family and those who I know. And I want them to see, hey, I, I don't want to be like you. I want what you have. Like, I don't want to honor you. I want to honor what you have. And, and there's just something just so sweet about that. And so I want to make sure that we understand because we are the image bearers in our community. We really are. People who don't know Jesus, they know us. And I hope they're seeing in our lives, in our lifestyle, there's a very clear delineation between light and dark. We don't blur those lines. We don't, we don't merge those together just to be so seeker friendly in, in, in some, some kind of way. But at the same time, if he took us as we were, we accept people as they are. And we trust God in his timing because for most of us, none of, we didn't get sanctified overnight. Most of us, we came to God with hangups and habits and addictions and, and everything else. And over time, what did God do? He burned them away. Because the closer you get to God, the less it, it scratches the itch. The closer you get to God, the less you want to be far from it with habits and behaviors. And so he loves us, and he's for us, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. So what does this light of life that Jesus promised lead us to? I know for you, there's a lot of things thinking over your life, your relationship with Jesus. There's been a lot of things that his light has brought you out of the darkness of. There's a lot of things in your life that his light has led you out of and away of. And I want you just to think for that for a moment because I'm going to share just two or three quick things. But for you, as you found the light of Jesus, what darkness has it led you out of? What dark recesses? What spaces were you at your lowest and his light led you out of? I just want to take a moment because sometimes we get so far from when we were hurt and broken, we forget to be thankful and grateful of the place he drew us out of. Here's a couple of things that I want to highlight today that all of us should be thankful for, the areas that the light of Jesus, the promise that he led us out of. And here's one of the first ones. The light of Jesus has led us out of, it has dispelled the darkness of death. Someone say the darkness of death. It has led us out of the darkness of death. You know, no matter who you meet, there will be a common theme. People are afraid to die. You want to make for an awkward conversation the next time you're with family or friends, say, hey, where are you going to go when you die? What's going to happen when you die? Like, are you ready to die? Are you going to heaven or hell? We're good for that as Christians, right? If you die tonight and the smoke billowed in your room, 
would you see God or Satan? Like, what was wrong with us in the 80s and 90s? I'm pretty sure these Bible tracks scared people away from God and didn't bring them towards God. Like, what was wrong with us? Anybody almost get unsaved from a Bible track? Like, what is going on? Anybody remember Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames? Are you kidding me? I still have traumas I'm trying to undo from that kind of stuff. But the, <laughs> the light of Jesus dispels the darkness of death. Like, we don't fear death. We welcome, the Bible says, to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord. Like there's a count appointed unto every man one day to die. And when we die, we don't fear death because we know that we spend eternity with our king, that we are living for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength in this life in preparation for the next life. And we know, we rest assured that our hope and our salvation is our king alone. So when the rest of the world is fearful of death, we welcome eternity with our king. And it dispels worrying about the afterlife. We look forward to what God has for us. And hopefully in our homes and those who we know, we can bring encouragement. We can bring joy. And we can even bring up the conversation and not in an awkward way, but talk about the excitement that one day this life ends and we get to see Jesus. One day all sorrow ends. One day all sickness ends. One day my lower back stops hurting. Right? One day, every fear, every pain, everybody who you're grieving over, every hardship, every trial you're experiencing, I've got wonderful news to tell you today. It ends. One day, the Bible says we'll be in a resurrected body. We'll be as happy as that baby I keep hearing. Like, you just got to be happy just to just, you know. One day, it all ends. And that's encouraging because sometimes this life can be discouraging. Sometimes, we honest, this life is depressing. But you know what? There is an end. There is an end to it, and that is in the person of Jesus. Here's the second thing I want to share with you. The light that Jesus provides, it dispels the darkness of lacking a conviction of sin. This is a big one. Let me tell you why. Have you ever been in a movie theater, and you come out, and you can barely see when you come out? You feel like a vampire. Well, how movies are, because my daughter took me to a movie last Saturday or Sunday. I can't remember the day. Um, Movies now, they're not two hours anymore. That's old school. That's like back to the future, like back in those days, right? Movies now about three, three and a half, maybe four, depending on the credits. And so when you come out, you come out like one eye open, and you're like halfway trying to see your car because it is so like your eyes, just, your eyes just can't adjust that quickly. You go from four hours of a dark warehouse, and now you're out in the parking lot for, you know, the sun blinding your eyes. You feel like you're saw on the road to Damascus. And so I'm like this trying to find my car. I'm like, my girls are used to it because they get movies all the time. I can't see. Our eyes don't properly adjust, right? Well, I want to say this. Our spiritual eyes should never properly adjust to sin. We should never sit and be like, God's going to forgive me. Hey, he's full of grace and mercy. Like, that's, that's wrong. Jesus, he would heal somebody or he'd do something, and what would he say after? Go and sin no more. Because he loved them too much for them to get back into what they were. In our day and age with the internet and all of the kind of stuff, there are so many private sins that people are just holding and keeping and convicted about every now and then. Let me tell you what, the Bible is very, very clear. Mold grows in the dark. Sin grows in the dark. But the last thing that private sin, the last thing your flesh and the last thing the devil want, wants is for you to expose that sin. Because the Bible says that we, when we confess our sins to one another, what's there? Healing. See, the enemy lies to us and says, oh, there's so much shame and you shouldn't confess. You shouldn't bring in an accountability partner. You shouldn't let people know what you're going through. No, that's where healing and wholeness comes from. Please, today, whether you're in the building or online, confess your sin. Don't have the private sin. Don't have all these hangups, mental and emotional. Let them go and give it to God and trust that he will bring healing and wholeness. Amen? But it's okay to talk about sin. It's okay to get those things out but it's not okay to not feel conviction. If you ever feel conviction, your whole day's messed up because you said something, you thought something, you looked at something, whatever it is, and your whole day's messed up, that's a good thing. The moment you lose that conviction, you're in trouble. The moment you can sin and not feel bad about something, that shows that you are far and getting distant from God's spirit and God's presence. Amen? Here's the next one. 
the light of Jesus dispels the darkness of trusting in the temporary. This might be my favorite one. Let me tell you why. It dispels the darkness of trusting in the temporary. Why? Because this world will never give us lasting faith, hope, or love. So please stop being surprised when people let you down. Please stop being surprised when goals and dreams don't feel like you thought they were going to feel once you accomplish them. Please don't be surprised when people don't give you lasting faith, hope, and love. They were always supposed to disappoint you. You find out how close you are to God by how much people let you down. Like if your sun and your moon rises and falls on people or on circumstance, then you are not as close to God as you thought you might be. People are supposed to, things are supposed to let us down because there's no eternal faith, hope, and love in people. Amen? For the followers of Jesus Christ, we are disciples. We look to him, the Bible says, the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he did what? He endured the cross, scorning its shame because of what his hope was on. Not this world, but the world to come. This is what the light leads us out of out of those dark places of looking for the world to gratify us and satisfy us. And whenever we find ourselves in the world, when we find ourselves getting stuck on the world or going back into errors and ways of thinking that are dark or ungodly, remember 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Remember these words. God says, talking to you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. God's special possession I bet no one's called you their special possession this week. Your wife, your wife might look at you funny, but you, you are a special possession that you may declare the praise of him. Listen to this. He called you out of darkness. Why would you go back? Why would you, why would you compromise the darkness? Why would we go back and play with sin that God already brought you out of? Well, I just do it every now and then. That's not how you get rid of a weed just taking off the top. You go down to the root and you get out of that darkness and into his wonderful light. It's such a beautiful, beautiful depiction that God is giving us here. Out of darkness into the light. And whenever we are tempted or in dark scenarios, situations, we have to be able to fix our eyes on the light. To say, I don't compromise. I don't operate in the gray because Jesus told me he is the light of the world and I will follow him with all of my heart soul, and mind. And what's funny is that the darkness lies to you whenever we compromise, whenever we operate in the gray, whenever we go back to old habits and behaviors, old coping mechanisms. It's just a lie. Let me ask a quick question. When has sin ever delivered? When is being depressed, angry, mad, sad, going back to anything from the old nature, the old you, when has it ever delivered? It's always promised but has it ever delivered? When have you ever sinned and gotten further in life? When have you sinned and you ever got healthy, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually? When have you ever sinned and God promoted you or God done something great in your life? When have you ever sinned and your, your marriage got healthier? Your kids just started living for God. It's a lie of darkness. It's a lie of the enemy. This I am statement of Jesus is so beautiful. Let me tell you why. Because it's unlike any other I am statement. See, the other I am statements we can't really identify with. We will never be the shepherd. We will never be the, 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 the gate. We will never be the way, the truth, and the life. You and I could never relate to those things. I'll never be the way, the truth, and life to God. But this one, not only can we identify with, but we get a part to play. Remember, Jesus says he was the light of the world. Remember that, right? John 8. Watch Jesus says in Matthew 5. He doesn't say he's the light of the world in this verse. Watch what he says. He says, you are the light of the world. So he goes from being the light of the world, and once we believe, repent, receive him, and are living in this light, you know what he says? I want you to carry the light. I want you to be my light. I want you to take me to every home, to every PTA meeting, to every practice, to every grocery store. I want you to take me to every gym. I want you to take me to everywhere you go, everywhere you go, and I want you to be what? My light. What a privilege. What a high honor. And you and I are embarrassed to pray in public? Are you joking me right now? 
embarrassed to play our music around other people who don't know? Are you kidding me right now? Embarrassed to post a testimony? Are you kidding me right now? He says, you are my light. He says, we got to get rid of all this country dark in our community. You are my light. Let me finish reading the verse because I'm excited because I already know what the verse says. So I'm excited. He says, you are the light of what? The world. The world doesn't need more churches. The world needs more disciples and more lights. You are my light. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus says you embody a town. He believes that you are going to reproduce after yourself and you're not going to be this isolated person by themselves. He says, but you are a town. Not only are you a town, you can't be hidden. You are on a hill. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he doesn't say let my shine, light shine. He says let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How amazing. Your good deeds. So we're not saved by good deeds. We're saved by grace. Nothing we can do to deserve salvation. Unmerited grace because Jesus died for you and for me became our sins. We're saved. Oh, but people see the light by what? Our good deeds. That there should be something about my life and our lives, my home, our homes. There there should be some deeds that people are seeing and they're saying, I don't want to be like them, but I want their God. I don't don't really know what's going on, but I, I want that peace and I want that perspective and I want that hope and I want that joy and I want that health. I want that, the Bible says, they're going to see our deeds and not glorify us, not pat us on the back, but glorify our Father who's in heaven. So I just want to end the conversation today where I started it. Does your light lead people to Jesus? Does your light lead people to Jesus? And let's start in a very easy place at home. Does your light lead people to Jesus or are they turned off by your light? Does your light lead people to Jesus with friends and family? When they're around you, do they want more of God or less of God? When they're around you, is there just this this curiosity to what it must be like to serve God faithfully? Chances are the people closest to us can answer that question. Does your light lead people to Jesus? And one day when it's all said and done and someone does all of our funerals, this would be the most important thing they can answer about our lives. This person led people to Jesus. The light of their life is worth celebrating. And I pray for all of us in here today that we highlight in our lives this question. Does my light lead people to Jesus? Jesus said he's the light of the world, but he also said you're the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm to be a city, I'm to be a town, not hidden, but on a hill for everyone to see. He says, come join me. Come take part as we bring people into the house of God, bring people to the family of God. And and I'm excited for Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday to watch your light in real time. I wonder who's going to follow your light here because I know a lot of you, people follow your light to the Jaguar games. They do. And I know today people are going to follow your light to TPC. Anybody excited about watching TPC? And I know your light. People follow you to different outings and gatherings and different groups that you have and different outings and different things that you do in restaurants, any foodies in the house and coffee shops. People follow your light a lot of places. I wonder if your light will be bright enough to get them to a place of healing and wholeness on Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. But I'm so grateful that Jesus includes us in this statement that we can be part of the light and God can do wonderful things in and through your light in your life. Father, we thank you for your your faithfulness. We thank you for the words that speak to our heart. And I pray this does not fall on deaf ears, Father, in the building and online, Lord. 
Jesus, you made the great declaration. You said, I am. You declare to be Yahweh. You declare to be the way, the truth, Lord, in this statement. But not just I am. You are the light of the world, Father. You are everything light embodies, Father. You cannot be held by time or space. You exist outside of time and space. You are not held to the constructs of this life. You exist outside of it. And so, Lord, we believe you are the light of the world. And we thank you for your light that helps us walk out of any dark areas today of our life. Whatever area might be dark, whatever area might be a blind spot, Lord, you walk us out of these areas, we pray. But it wouldn't stop there, Lord, that our light would shine. That our deeds would shine. That people would glorify our Father and draw closer to you, we pray. And lastly, with your heads bowed, if you are far from Jesus in this place, we want to pray with you that you would do one of two things. One, if you're far from the Lord, but you've prayed a prayer to receive him, you'd rededicate your life or for others. The first time you pray to receive Jesus. And as a church, we are so thrilled that we get to pray this prayer with you today. And so if that is you in the building or online, we just ask you to just posture yourself in a place of surrender, humility, and pray this prayer with us. And if you pray this prayer, and believe in your heart, the Bible says you can rededicate your life. You can come back to the Lord like the prodigal, or you can welcome him for the very first time. So church family, let's pray this together. Lord God, we believe in you. We repent of our sins and welcome the light of Jesus into our lives. Give us a hunger for your word and for discipleship the rest of our days. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Put your hands together for the goodness of our God and our King.